you. And for more on the possibility of passing new gun control laws despite the NRA and its allies, I'm happy to be joined by Tina Dupuy, editor in chief of The Contributor and syndicated columnist, and by political reporter. Joe Williams, welcome to both of you. Thanks for having me. Uh, so you just heard that. Um, I want to thank Mr. Feldman again, but it's clear he is out of the mainstream uh, with uh, of, of registered gun owners. Tina? Well, he, he did actually have a couple of points that I do agree with him on. Sure. I believe that the ATF doesn't have uh, the budget to actually go and enforce the laws that are already on the books. I mean, he actually brought that up. I think that's a really good point. I think that's a, that's common ground that everyone can come together on and actually agree upon. The, the thing that it was really interesting to me is he did this classic thing that everyone who just doesn't want to see any more gun violence who just doesn't not even doesn't like guns just doesn't like being shot suddenly with the has to get into what, what I call like weaponese, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to start talking about uh, uh, assault rifles versus semi-auto versus full auto versus, you know, things with scopes or whatever. I have and to you give ha my daughter a gun on Saturday, exactly. so I can't have a background check till Monday. Tell her to stay home for the weekend. <laughs> exactly. Like, right, again, but it, we kind of like, but we take the bait. We go, oh no, well this, you know, it's high capacity, we need to do this, and then we want to get into d to definitions, and it's really a booby trap set by gun enthusiasts, and we've taken the bait over and over again. Let me bring in Joe. Joe, did the NRA send a message today that there's going to be no concessions and we're going to fight this to the death? Uh, that's the message I heard, um, and mainly because if something that you've been doing that keeps working, you, you're going to keep doing it. The NRA uh, is one of the well-funded, most powerful lobbies anywhere. Uh, certainly in American political history, they've had their, their, their victories and they keep coming. Uh, what's interesting, however, is the fact that we're still talking about it some month, uh, almost a month after the, the, the Newtown, Connecticut tragedy, mm -hmm. where before the NRA's uh, typical uh, strategy, if you will, would be to sort of lay low, wait for the violence to succumb, and then uh, set about entrenching what's already in place and, and even furthering uh, their ability to control the debate. It's, it's also kind of staggering to me to, to hear NRA people talk about the fact that more guns are going to solve the problem and that whole scenario about having a daughter who's been threatened, I mean, that only assumes that A, the daughter can actually use the gun in a, in, in a proper manner and can get the drop on whatever bad guy might be out there and that she wouldn't have the gun either stolen or taken and used against her to cause a, a, a kind of tragedy there. So a lot of their arguments are kind of fallacious. They keep being made over and over again and I think it's going to be really difficult to cut through the clatter and get something done uh, that will actually do some good and save some lives. I agree, Joe. I also want to point out that uh, in that left-wing Frank Lund's survey of NRA members, 74% of registered NRA, NRA members support only giving permits to citizens after they pass gun safety training. Again, the NRA is not in line with its members. So look, we know that both parties are going to use this as a political football, but could this conceivably split the GOP House the way the fiscal cliff vote did, or will House Republicans line up lockstep behind the NRA? Well, I think that House Republicans are going to have a very, very difficult time with this one. A split seems possible, but to me, the party and the, the, the coalitions that's in Congress right now that was willing to risk the full faith and credit of the United States and seem willing to risk it again, probably, to my eye, doesn't seem like it's going to give very much ground on this issue. They know where their contributions come from. They know what's important to their members back home. Nevertheless, the fact that President Obama is putting his weight behind this and has a commission uh, headed by the Vice President Joe Biden, who the NRA just basically loathes, I think is a very good sign for at, le at the very least a fight if no substantive action gets done. At least the, the marker gets put down by the White House and by the people on the left that this issue is not going to go away and that they're going to continue to try to push it to get some reasonable measures in place. Tina and Joe will be back in the next segment uh, and I look forward to continuing the conversation with both of you. But coming up first, the right wing can make all the jokes they want about global warming, but you don't see too many client scienti climate scientists buying beachfront property. Stick around. And for more, let's bring back editor-in-chief of the contributor Tina Dupuy and political reporter Joe Williams. Thank you both for sticking around. Joe, let me, let me start with you. I want to pick up on something Bill just said. Uh, he's not worried about convincing those who science can't convince. Should we try to convert our friends and neighbors and that coworker in the cubicle to believe in climate change, or is it best to just ignore these deniers? Well, if things continue apace, we won't really have to, because all the predictions that 
uh, Al Gore and others have been making about climate change are coming true. Not the fact necessarily that the earth is getting warmer and that we'll have 70 degree days in January, but that the storms will occur more frequently, they'll be more intense, they'll do a lot more damage. I guarantee you, you go up to uh, New Jersey and New York and the coastal areas, Rockaway Beach, you ask people there if climate change is real, some people who probably hadn't even considered the issue would definitely give you an absolute yes, mm -hmm. it's real and it destroyed my home. So I think that the polling is going to continue to go up because a lot of people were talking about it in the aftermath of Sandy, they're starting to get the message. And almost like the gun issue, the people are almost ahead of the politicians in this one, in that more people are starting to get the idea that this is happening as we get more and more difficult storms, more and more damage, and it hits them in the wallet, than people who are straggling behind and still convinced that this is not a factor. Tina, does President Obama need to do more to raise awareness and to fight for something here? He, well, I mean... He it depends on what your cause is. He always needs to do more until he actually accomplishes Fair something. Enough. But I think the, the biggest advocate, the greatest advocate for climate change is not Al Gore, it's Sandy. Uh, I think that, you know, as we see it uh, happening in front of us, it, it's going to be self evident. Of course, but. Uh, because, but Go ahead. If you would, please. No, please. <laughs> well, with the, what I'm saying is I agree with you on Sandy, and, and Mayor Bloomberg has been a real leader ever since. But with the Republican House, what can this president do to try to fight climate change? Well, I think that he needs to take on, you know, this, there's a huge industry that, the, uh, that is uh, actively campaigning against climate change and actively kind of sowing the seeds of skepticism when it comes to, to climate denial. And they're, and they're very effective at that. And those are people who pad their pockets with, with oil money. Uh, you know, they do things like, you know, every time that we have winter, that somehow shows that we are not having uh, global warming, right? Because, look, it snowed. Uh, and, and not knowing that you know the weather is not actually what climate is, and, and being able to to educate people a, a, as to the difference. Um, but when you have these super storms that are coming, it doesn't matter if there was a cold day. You know, we almost lost one, our biggest city. Yeah, well, and now we're having the storm of the century every other year. And uh, Joe, last fall, Al Gore called on President Obama to include a carbon tax in his fiscal cliff negotiations. That didn't happen. A lot of progressives were rooting for it. Do you think, uh, and you can jump in, Tina, if you want, but do you think that there's any chance we'll see this president even say the words carbon tax? But cap and trade was a Republican idea that they abandoned, just like they abandoned uh, their exactly. their their yeah. health care initiative. You know, I mean, the the individual mandate was something that Nixon came out with. So if you know, it basically the formula is if, if it, it was a Republican idea, and then Obama says that's a great idea, it suddenly is no longer a good idea when you're a Republican. Joe, exactly. If it comes out the president's mouth, then chances are it's a non-starter among a certain segment. Remember, we had a, a convention not too long ago in Tampa where he, President Obama was actually mocked by the Republican uh, nominee, Mitt Romney, for suggesting that he would do something about the rising uh, temperatures and the rising oceans. I think it's incumbent upon President Obama to do something. I think he will do something. Will it be a sweeping change? I highly doubt that, because not only do you have a core segment of the Republican uh, uh, coalition that's dead set against this, but you also have several oil state Democrats. Mary Landro mm -hmm. comes to mind, uh, Joe Manchin in West Virginia, who would be dead set against any kind of cap and trade, any kind of carbon tax, anything that they think would cost them jobs and therefore cost the election. But the countervailing argument to that is that the evidence is impossible to ignore. If we're talking about snow, we're talking about snow apocalypse here in D.C., 16 inches of snow over a 24-hour period. We're talking about Superstorm Sandy, the confluence of three different weather fronts that cause such destruction. Uh, Bill McKibben was right. It becomes an economic issue at its fundamental core. People have to see that. I think the public is starting to see that, and I think they're ahead of the politicians on this one. I think you're both right. Fighting climate change is good capitalism. Tina Dupuis, brilliant editor-in-chief of The Contributor, and political reporter Joe Williams. I'm such a fan of both of you. Thank you both for joining me this